And to close out our session this morning, we have John Zare, who will be talking about nitrogen fixers in the Arctic. Okay, well, I'm happy to be here, especially since I spent 10 hours in an airport trying to get a plane out of home to get here. But um, uh, it's probably not that surprising for me to be at this meeting, but it's maybe kind of surprising for me to be in this session. For those of you who know me, you should know it's a little odd because I don't go places where I can't wear an Aloha shirt. So, <laughs> so it's, uh, uh, it's kind of a strange story. Um, this is um, mostly about Katie Harding's thesis project. Um, she, she's not here, um, but I just wanted to kind of start off with a reminder of a little bit of how we got where we are with nitrogen and nitrogen fixation. So Redfield talked about nitrogen fixation a long time ago, but for him it wasn't that interesting. It was just a way of filling up the deficit of nitrogen and, and not, not a primary limiting nutrient. And then we spent a lot of time where nitrogen fixation was just assumed not to be that interesting and the rates weren't that important. And, Ed Carpenter and Doug Capone really championed a lot of nitrogen fixation research um, before it actually got really interesting when people started thinking about the big, big picture biogeochemical cycles and whether or not nitrogen fixation could balance the losses of denitrification. And now we, we sort of assume that at least in oligotrophic oceans that nitrogen fixation is a large fraction of, of new production. And that has led up to collecting a lot of data now by various methods, um, using genes, by making measurements of nitrogen fixation with the N15 method, et cetera. And this database kind of put together everything that was everybody had accumulated around the globe for many years. And so you can see a couple of problems. One is we still haven't sampled much of the ocean. And in particular, uh, the polar regions are, are um, uh, really lacking in, in data on nitrogen fixation. And so why is that? Why, why is that? Well, nitrogen fixation was assumed to be a warm water tropical and subtropical phenomenon, partially because that's where we find trichodesmium. And so it was really presumed to be uh, limited largely to tropical and subtropical gyres uh, and equatorial regions, <coughs> places where there was low fixed nitrogen availability, so low concentrations of nitrate and ammonium. So remember that, because I'm going to come back to that later. Notice that uh, uh, they put this thing right over the polar region. So clearly they thought that was not that interesting. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> only teasing, uh, thought it was kind of funny when I, when I put that figure in there. But um, in addition to that, as people think about trying to look at global rates of nitrogen fixation, my understanding, um, had some conversations with Mick follows about this, is that a, lo a lot of the models basically make this map work by putting a temperature limitation on nitrogen fixation. And in fact, we knew that there wasn't ultimately a real limitation of temperature because you can find nitrogen fixation in Antarctic lakes uh, and various places. So temperature alone is not really limiting, but we thought it was in the oceans. <clears throat> now I'll rapidly show my ignorance here uh, because this is not a region that I've spent much time. Uh, and I'm actually really hoping for some comments about what's going on. But, but the reason that there could be some nitrogen fixation going on is, first of all, blooms could be um, depleting nitrogen concentrations in the Arctic regions. And the water that is moving through the Bering Strait can be depleted before it actually even gets carried into the Arctic Ocean. So you could imagine, then, uh, that there could be nitrogen-limiting conditions sufficient that there'd be nitrogen fixation. So uh, Rachel Sippler and Debbie Bronk, who are responsible for me being in this project, um, found pre preliminary evidence of nitrogen fixation in this region, uh, but they didn't know what organisms were responsible. And they got our group uh, involved to try to, to try to figure out what organisms might be responsible for nitrogen fixation if it's occurring there. <clears throat> so as a, as a backdrop from tropical and subtropical, these are the actors, or the players in nitrogen fixation. Trichodesmium, of course, famous, famous microorganism. Um, the diatom symbionts, um, heterocystis cyanobacteria. Um, in the late 90s, we found gene sequences for Crocospheria and this organism that uh, we call USNA because it's an uncultivated organism. It's a cyanobacterium, uh, which I will 
describe it in a little bit, uh, but it's a, it's a symbiont of a haptophyte. And then a whole bunch of heterotrophic bacteria uh, that I don't really know, uh, I'm not really confident of what their role is in nitrogen fixation, although these gene sequences show up um, in basically any environment you look at, including lakes where nitrogen fixation isn't, isn't occurring. Um, these heterotrophic bacterial nitrogenase gene sequences show up in a lot of aquatic environments, and it has yet to be shown that they are actually fixing nitrogen, so we await uh, await that discovery, and I'm not going to talk about them. So it's really these cyanobacteria in tropical and subtropical waters that have been interesting. And the one of them that has most recently been discovered is this thing called unicellular cyanobacteria nitrogen fixer group A um, that we found from a gene sequence. Actually, I realized as I was sitting here waiting to get up, 20 years ago, 1998, we found the gene sequence for this organism. It's still not uh, cultivated in our hands, uh, but what we have found out about it is that it pops up around the world um, in all the tropical and subtropical places that trichodesmine is, um, and then in some unexpected places like coastal regions and, and et cetera. It's a cyanobacterium, the symbiont is, but the genome has lost a lot of genes, so it no longer can fix carbon, for example. So it's barely a cyanobacterium. But what it can do very well is it can fix nitrogen. So, and it's lost photosystem too, so it doesn't evolve oxygen like a typical cyanobacterium. But it has everything it needs for fixing nitrogen. And we've shown the, this whole story, I'm not going to go into, some of you have heard it before. Uh, it's an a, a endosymbiont, we believe, of this haptophyte that's related to Braruta sphera bigelowi, which is an interesting organism, which has at least some life stages where it makes these calcareous plates. It's really interesting. And we showed by um, isotope experiments that the cyanobacterium happily makes nitrogen, uh, fixes nitrogen from the air, passes it to the haptophyte, and the haptophyte happily fixes carbon and passes it back to the cyanobacterium. So it's an interesting, interesting organism. And it's not one organism. It's actually, if you look at the gene sequences for nitrogenase uh, from the environment, there's actually a whole family of of these cyanobacteria that, ha that coincide with a whole family of the Brarutosphera or haptophyte host. And we're sort of figuring out who goes with who, but there's important ones are this group A1 and A2, which have been found in quite a few different um, places around the world now. And we're still discovering a few more things. We, we started out by finding these by gene sequences, which then allowed us to make quantitative PCR uh, methods for detecting them. And then in, in a group in Spain, um, <clears throat> and we worked with the Max Planck and made some fish probes, but the group in Spain uh, came up with fish probes for the hosts as well as the cyanobacterium. And that's really the only way we have of visualizing this thing, because otherwise there's nothing really to look for. So what you're looking at here is a green hybridization to the ribosomal RNA of the haptophyte and a red 16S fish probe to the cyanobacterial partner. So you're, you're actually specifically labeling both partners. And we have specific probes for each of these different, different groups, so we can distinguish these. These are not the same probes. They're actually a different probe set for this one and for that one. And that's important as we get to this project now. So I have uh, Rachel Sippler and Debbie Bronk to thank for um, um, getting me involved in this project um, because I couldn't really imagine uh, that this area would have anything interesting for me. I wasn't interested in the heterotrophic bacteria, uh, but it was important to do this work. Uh, and so we got involved, and Katie Harding is doing it for her thesis, and Kendra is my uh, research associate, and Britt Henke is a new technician. And they've done all the field work uh, on this project. And this is just showing some stations that have been sampled. And they've been sampled by these PCR primers for, these different, for the cyanobacterium, for the host, uh, the fish probes for the host, for the cyanobacterium, N15 experiments, N15 experiments in conjunction with visualization of who took up the N15 N2 by nanosims. And that's what I'm going to show you the results of. So these are just um, transects um, off, of, off of the shelf here, um, sort of in the edge of the Chukchi and Beaufort Sea. And again, this is what these two major groups of the symbiosis look like. One of them is quite a bit bigger than the other one. Um, this, is, this is typical of the ligotrophic waters out in the open ocean. This is what we originally, the sequence we originally found at Hawaii, for example. Um, 
and these are the two, um, two different groups. And we found the same thing um, in the Bering Sea um, off, of, off of Nome. So same probes look like the same thing. <clears throat> and it went on and actually we're able to show that, that these, um, the sequences for these organisms as well as cells that could be hybridized to these probes as well as DNA that could be amplified by the qPCR primers were present at a range of stations, not only in the Bering Sea, but in the Chukchi and the Beaufort Sea. So this is multiple independent methods that show that these organisms are present in the Arctic Ocean. It's undeniable that, that they are there. The question is more why and what does it matter? And if you drill down into the genetics of the information we have, we look at the gene sequences, um, not only do these things look the same as what we see in the open ocean, the warmer waters, but genetically, they're the same, same very specific DNA sequence type. So it's the same genotype that we find at Aloha for A1 that was present in the Bering Sea. And it's the same A2 type that is found in multiple different locations, the Atlantic and the Pacific, that's also found in the Chukchi Sea. So this is kind of uh, amazing to me because these organisms seem to be, you might expect, I might have expected that there would be a specific cold water ecotype that exists in the Arctic, but th thus far that's not true. And then this year, um, Shiozaki published a paper just a few months ago that also reported use in A sequences in the Chukchi Sea, not far from where we're looking at here. So the evidence is, is quite clear that these organisms are now um, in, the, in the Arctic Ocean. So we did nanosims experiments as well, where um, instead of adding N15, N2 to a bottle and then filtering everything onto a filter and getting a rate per, per volume but not knowing who did it, uh, we did this experiment, but then with the nanosims instrument, you can actually look at the specific contribution of the isotope enrichment uh, in individual cells microscopically. And this is what the results look like, and it basically shows that these symbiotic organisms, the cells which are, which are identified by fish protocols are the cells that are fixing nitrogen. This has drawn on there so you can see where the cyanobacterium is, and this is the haptophyte host. And so you can see that the nitrogen that's fixed by the cyanobacterium rapidly is assimilated by the host. It's, it's a symbiotic association and they're, and, they're, and they're feeding each other. So we have these types of results now from not only the Bering Sea, where the highest rates were, but also um, in the Chukchi Sea. And so we can actually measure cell-specific rates, uh, femtomoles nitrogen per cell per day, for example. And the interesting thing is if you look at these rates, uh, first of all, in the Bering Sea, um, the rate that's calculated from the individual cells that, that, that were measured by Katie actually adds up pretty close to what the total rate was measured by Rachel Sippler in a bulk, bulk um, rate measurement, indicating they could they could account for basically all of the nitrogen fixation. In the Chukchi, the, the rates are really low, both at the cellular basis and in bulk. Uh, and we can talk about what those mean. Um, they're, they're small numbers, and this doesn't add up to as large of a fraction. Um, I'm less confident of both of these numbers because they are so, because they are so low. So bottom line is use in A is not a warm water bug. Um, and it tolerates or lives in uh, lower temperatures than the other diazotrophs. And furthermore, um, this organism is found not only in the Arctic, but places where there's fixed inorganic nitrogen. And so you can ask, well, why is that? I mean, one of the dogmas that we, lear that we learned uh, growing up was that when there's fixed nitrogen, things don't fix, when there's fixed nitrogen available, you do not fix nitrogen from the air because it's so expensive to do so. So back to doing some interesting experiments uh, with use in A. Um, and this shows that actually if you add nitrate to the water that use in A is, is living in, they continue to fix nitrogen. And sometimes they're actually even stimulated and fix nitrogen faster than before you added nitrate. I can't explain that one, but the one thing I can explain is that if we now do a, the inverse experiment, instead of lab labeling N15, uh, N2, instead of labeling N2 with N15, we label nitrate with N15, we see that it won't take it up. 
this is a eukaryotic algae, it won't take up nitrate. So this is, uh, this is pretty interesting. It's at least one of the few, if not the only uh, organism that I um, know about that, that, uh, that does this. And I, and I just got a text from, my, from Kendra uh, while I was sitting there. And we were, we've done the next obvious experiment, which is add in 15 ammonium. Everybody takes up ammonium, right? No. So we're, we're, uh, we don't understand the genetics or physiological reason for this yet, but this probably has something to do with why this symbiosis is found in such a wider range of, of regions than other, other nitrogen fixers. So these are the fun things to think about, and I'm sure you're thinking of more. Um, is nitrogen fixation important in the nitrogen budget? Well, the rates are pretty low, so I'm not sure. For me, I find this biologically intriguing that these, these cyanobacteria are actually penetrating Arctic waters, but whether or not that's going to turn out to be important in the nitrogen budget has yet to be seen. There's a lot of spatial and temporal variability in the data we have, so until we have more measurements, it's probably hard to assess. But where did they come from? So there's this interesting phenomenon as well that as you go north from the subtropical gyre, they actually disappear. Uh, we, we've shown this in another project. And then they pop up again in the Arctic. So there's a good chance that these things are actually endemic there. And it's possible that they're endemic there because they have uh, different life stages that they can actually live in the sediments as a calcified form and then reseed the populations under nitrogen limiting conditions. So um, these things uh, may be endemic, but this is something I'd be interested in your comments on is what, what you think about where they could be coming from. And given that they're there, is this a recent thing? Or are we just now finding out about it because we looked? Uh, and if uh, either way, is this something that's going to be one of the associated types of changes that is going to occur in the Ar Arctic? And then the biggie is, is there any chance that we're going to actually, if we look, find this in the Southern Ocean as well? So um, that, that's my story. Um, I'm sticking to it. And uh, I'd like to thank Matt Mills and Ann Dacus gave us a lot of help in getting the nanosims uh, up and running at, at Stanford. So thank you very much. Hey, um, John, um, great talk. Um, and I think you just explained something that we see perhaps in our data sets when we look at metatranscriptomes in the mesopelagic and the bathypelagic. Um, under uh, low oxygen conditions, we see a lot of expression of nitrogenase. And uh, I always it was puzzled by that cause, because there's abundant ammonia in most of these places that I'm talking about. And uh, so it would be really curious to see whether, did you have, can you comment on whether these symbionts, you've observed them in, in such deep waters? Um, no, well, I don't think we have any data from anywhere where we've seen them that deep in the water. But I think the general point is still valid, which is all of those assumptions and paradigms we had about where you find nitrogen fixation, don't believe them. Um, you, know, you know, I think one of, one of the things is that all of those paradigms came from doing experiments with a millimolar ammonium or, you know, 10 micromolar nitrate or something like that. And it, the benefits of using fixed nitrogen source versus fixing nitrogen start to get pretty close, especially for nitrate if, if it's uh, um, even lower concentration. So I, so I think... I think you'll find that, what I'm getting to is, I think you'll find that probably heterotrophic bacteria, for example, don't care whether there's nitrate, it'll still fix nitrogen. But I don't think, I don't think, I don't think this thing is there. It's a phototroph. Although, Bethany, where's Bethany? She, she found this thing expressing genes in the sediments, so we don't know what that's about. Um, 
that may be related to how I think that it survives through the, through the winter in sediments, for example. Uh, thanks for a really interesting talk. I, I find this really exciting. Um, it seems to me, however, the bigger question than are they in the Southern Ocean is are they in the Atlantic Arctic? And so I'm curious as to whether you guys have attempted observations over in the marginal seas on that side of the Arctic. I'm sorry, where in the Atlantic? The, well, the Atlantic Arctic up, uh, you know, Scandinavia. Oh, Europe, yeah, no. Um, we have it. Other people, um, Connie Lovejoy, uh, this paper, Blaze et al., they had done some work in that edge and they didn't come up with it. But you know, I, I don't know. I, I think it needs to be looked at again. And we, we, we hope to do that, but somebody else might, might see it before, before we do. Great, thanks. Hello. Uh, so I couldn't see because I'm probably at the back, but the Delta 15N signature of the, um, your symbiotic nitrogen fixer, what, what was the value for that? So these were N15 enrichment tracer experiments. Okay. 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 So just to, have you done measurements on, on what their Del 15 N value is? As they no, I think that would probably be difficult. But no, we haven't we haven't tried to do that. Uh, who's calling here? Barn. <laughs> great, great talk. Um, during the IceScapes cruises, we were surveying around the Chuchi Sea uh, for cockle of the forest, and we found a lot of different species of cockle of the forest, but we never found Brarutosphera, and that was 2011. So it's, it, if it's there, it's at very low abundance. Well, it's low abundances even on a good day. I mean, this is a thing that usually misleads people, is that even even the subtropics where we say, hey, it's really important. I mean, it can be a few cells per milliliter. And yeah, that's yeah. In in more subtropical environments, we'll see it. Uh, for example, in the AMT cruises, it can be much more abundant there, and we'll get yeah, thirty or forty cells per mil of it. Uh, but it's never very abundant. I'd like yeah. to hear more about that because yeah. I've not I've not heard anybody tell me that they've actually visualized. In fact, yeah. we don't know. We that use SEM uh, to, to visualize it. So, and there. Well, that's important because we don't even know. That would be the first observation of the open ocean actually making it being calcareous. Because what we know is that actually what we're usually studying is actually a modal cell that doesn't have plates. I mean, these things are, we, we see them in the Gulf of Maine just right here all the time. And, and they see them, you know, they're found off of Japan as well. Yeah, well, yeah. that's, we're working yeah. with those people, but right. it only occurs a very short period of time in the year as a calcareous, uh, with calcareous plates, and then, it, and then the rest of the time it's in a modal form. Right. Hi, yeah, I'm curious, um, back here. Um, do you have some idea of how much new production this symbiosis is stimulating relative to, say, regenerated production in the Arctic? Um, up there, no. I have no idea. We, you, if Debbie wants to comment on that, but I, I don't. I have no idea uh, up there. In, in the subtropical gyres, it can be the major nitrogen fixer, and if you believe the budgets, it can be you know up to 50% of new production or something like that, and it could be a major major source of that. But getting the balance of who's doing how much is really hard. <laughs> 